Thank you, Boyana. Thank you, the organizer, everybody. Thank you, the audience, for being here. Apologies for having been a bit antisocial in the last 24 hours. I was really into the process of reshaping, rethinking this paper today, which, I mean, I'm usually not a polemic person per se. I, I don't know if it will come across as a polemic paper, but let, let's see. So, um, this paper is an attempt at reading debates surrounding the Me Too with the help of Hegel's philosophy of right. And it is, of course, an artificial and anachronistic exercise that still, uh, still seems to me worth conducting for highlighting some controversial premises and implications of what I consider to be the cultural politics of the Me Too. In accomplishing this artificial and anachronistic exercise, I'm in good company has Trauco Kope in 2021, I guess it was 2021, yeah, uh, published on, on crisis and, and critique, a piece entitled Keine Frau muss müssen, Ego in the time of Me Too. And this is why I originally conceived this paper uh, partially as a response to is, but after working it overnight, it took quite a different shape. Um, so that in the end, I'm afraid that my paper may not do justice to Trauger's articles, as it will take it as a point of departure, but will not properly engage, um, engage it in, on its own grounds, since I will not contend that the uses of Hegel uh, that the paper proposes are inconsistent or inappropriate or wrong, I will just employ Hegel differently. And, and I guess also that the nature of the querel uh, between us is less about Hegel and more about the characterization of the Me Too and the criticism that it received from different angles. Um, I'm also afraid that my paper will not be able to do justice to Hegel because Hegel will be dissected into bits and pieces and manipulated ad hoc. And in the end, my paper may also not do justice to this conference as I did more as a, as a contribution to feminist debates rather than to Hegelian debate. So again, apologies, but I will start with a short reconstruction of the general tenets of Strauko's articles. And then, since one can say that Me Too, as well, is nothing but the series of its actions, and that its political character can only be assessed against them, I will propose a Hegelian critical reading of some core aspects of the Me Too cultural logic that I centered um, around three claims uh, that only yes means yes, I believe you, and my body, my choice. This is actually an older slogan, in fact, the last one. Uh, while doing so, I will try to connect Hegel's different passages of the philosophy of right with three classical feminist themes that have been taking center stage within the Me Too movement uh, and are related to the slogan, of course. The issue of consent and responsibility, number one. The issue of justice and punishment, number two. And the issue of sexual autonomy and, and sexual politics. And this latter it's, will be disappointing, I guess, because it's, it's the, the shorter part. Anyway, um, so my criticism is premised on the acknowledgement of the incredible merits of Me Too for having imposed a global debate of unprecedented scope on sexual violence, increasing public attention and social awareness of the phenomenon. And just to be clear about it, I'm not saying that the ends do not justify the means. I'm rather asking the means or the tactics to use a more old-fashioned Marxist-Lenin slogan to justify their ends, the strategies. So let's start from Trauco and the Me Too. Uh, so Trauco's article suggests, and I quote, to return to Hegel, in particular to Hegel's conception of marriage as an ethical unity and to his theory of action in order to think about sexual autonomy, end of quote. Um, and this uh, as a way to respond to some of the criticism raised against the Me Too movement by the progressive left and by some feminists, such as, for example, Laura Kipnis, the author of this controversial book, Unwanted Sex, that came out in 2018. Unwanted sex, uh, Sexual Paranoia Comes to Campus. Zalko so summarizes criticism as follows, and I quote again, some warn against a carceral feminism that relies too heavily on regulative and punitive measures, forgetting in the process that the zero tolerance strategy was originally designed by right wing politicians. That's one uh, you know, stream of criticism, so to say. The second one, again, in Zraga's words, for others, the Me Too movement tend to infantilize women, treating them as inherently weak. So the argument goes, it denies them the capacity of free agency and confines them to a state of permanent minority. 
That's argument or criticism number two. And lastly, there are also those who emphasize, I'm still quoting Rauco, that sexuality is not the field of justice. In this perplexing situation, Trauco argues, where uh, both the conservative right and a large part of the progressive left seems to consider me too, too prudish, too punitive, and ultimately dangerous, I propose we turn to Hegel to help us out." End of quote. Hegel, in other words, according to Trauco, would be on the side of the Me Too against those who argue that the Me Too went too far. Basically, uh, Trauco relies on Hegel's marriage model to think of sexual relations as a provisional marriage and show that Hegel would be in favor of a legal regulation of sexuality. And additionally, it draws on Hegel's theory of Handlung with regard to the norms of sexual conduct, or conduct, sorry, to conclude that, I quote, if the action is inherently risky and open, every sexual deed contains the possibility of turning out to be assault or rape. And then he argues that, and I quote again, exactly where the line runs and whether a sexual act is rape ultimately depends on the valid norms and intersubjective recognition, which in the event of a collision of interpretations is usually obtained in the forum dedicated to conflict resolution in modern society, that is, in the court of law. And he concludes that it would be wrong, uh, both politically and speculatively, to defend the Kantian theory of sexual action, which fundamentally protects the agents from the consequences of their actions." End of quote. My counter-argument would be that Me Too didn't go too far and should probably go further, but maybe rethinking its aims and strategy, taking more thoroughly into account the big pictures of power relations, patriarchal and racial capitalism, and its neoliberal versions. I will, in turn, ask Hegel to help me out in a, outlining a radical feminist perspective from which we can critically rethink victimhood and responsibility, challenge hyper-criminalization from the perspective of feminist justice, and think of sexual politics beyond the narrow spectrum of sexual autonomy. Only yes means yes. Hegel on action, dissent, and dissidence. In the Me Too framework, the notion of victimhood has played a key role in shaping the characterization of women subject qua survivors of sexual abuse or victim of sexual predators, praise of sexual violence. While some feminists actually maintain that victimhood should be reclaimed against neoliberal conception of women's agency, premised on resilience or responsibility, and the latter narrowly conceived as the individual capacity of freely shaping one's own destiny without complaining about the material uh, obstacles. Um, so while some feminists maintain that victimhood should be reclaimed against agency um, or new liberal version and understanding of agency, some other feminists argued that reclaiming victimhood and positing women across the sexual spectrum as passive and weak and as opposed to men who actively seek to fulfill their own sexual needs only perpetuate ways of thinking and acting that make sexual violence possible. The notion of victimhood has the advantage of granting legal protection to women's sexual integrity, and I'm of course not against it. Uh, women may enjoy all sorts of sex, but certainly not what they experience as sexual abuse, of which indeed they have, they are victims. However, the Me Too seems to be incapable of thinking women subjects otherwise, even when they speak out, individually or collectively, even when they became agents, women are agents qua victims. Agency, on the other hand, is certainly not a bad word, but it is not the right word either, I would say, because of its liberal and neoliberal currency, but also because of its being rooted on what Egolf would consider a Kantian and rather abstract notion of freedom. My claim here is that Hegel's theory of action could allow us to overcome the dichotomy of victimhood and agency in view of a feminist notion of responsibility premised on dissent and dissidence vis-a-vis patriarchal society. Of course, um, I mean, I, I will develop that there's no specific notion of dissent and dissidence that I could find in Hegel uh, in the philosophy of right, uh, but for sure I'm relying on his notion of responsibility. Uh, to do so, so to return to Hegel's theory of action, of action qua, qua responsibility, I will have to make a digression and consider some highlights of the Me Too debate on consent and even to refer to Kojev's notion of authority. 
So only yes means yes is the slogan that best epitomizes uh, the Me Too effort at redefining consent, both in relation to rape, sexual aggression, sexual harassment, um, and all the different manifestations of, of sexual violence that belong to the same sexist and uh, patriarchal spectrum, although uh, do not, uh, cannot be uh, conflated. And on the spectrum, we can also inscribe misogyny, chauvinism, gender discrimination, and so on and so forth. But only yes means yes implies that silence means nothing and sex without clear consent is rape. As the newly voted Spanish reform of the criminal code states, I quote, consent can only be considered consent when it has been freely manifested through actions that in accordance with the circumstances clearly express the person's wishes, end of quote. Such new and thicker definition of consent uh, opposes and overcomes the traditional one, which is, by the way, still the dominant one, according to which consent should be inferred from the lack of resistance, leaving to women the burden to prove that they had been subjected to and resisting to threat, intimidation, or violence. However, we can remark that paradoxically enough, while all legislation considered all, uh, all too easily to men the right to presume that there was consent where there was no resistance, the new Me to inspire legislation assigned to men the duty to request consent and retrospectively to prove it if needed. Women, paradoxically again, only appear as active or agential dispensers of consent. Moreover, as Catherine Le Magresse, a prominent French feminist legal theorist and the author of uh, Les Pièges du Consentement, uh, as she has stressed, and I quote, consent is a word that only makes sense from the perspective of the aggressor, as he is the one who seeks for consent. And yet, Le Magresse uses this argument for actually making a case for a narrower definition of consent, whereby there is no consent and there can be no proper consent if the relationship between sexual partners is somehow asymmetrical in terms of age, power, wealth, social status, professional hierarchy, etc. So Le Magret's claim for a restriction of existing understanding of consent represents an interesting paradigmatic case of the paradoxical logic, which I would like to spell out, by which victimhood is further produced in order to protect victims, who are somehow reduced to the role of gatekeepers of their sexual integrity. Le Magrès and many feminists actually make a case for restraining women's possibility of consent in relation to what is usually referred to as the gray zone of sexual abuses that I think could be perfectly illustrated by Kojev's notion of authority. So in 1942, Kojev writes this book, La Notion de l'Autorité, under the Nazi occupation, um, where he phenomenologically describes and analyzes four different typologies or ideal types of, of authority. What is relevant for my argument is Kojev's overall definition of authority that for him stands worth apart from violence and, and constraint. Authority is actually undermined by both violent and violence and contractual agreement. Since in, in a circular fashion, Kojev defines authority as that spontaneous and immediate consent, um, which is neither extorted, if it is extorted, authority ceases to be authority and becomes violence. Uh, but this consent is not negotiated either, because if it needs scrutiny, approval, or validation, authority is undermined and delegitimated. And still, this spontaneous consent is delivered for different reasons. So authority, Kojev says, is what does not meet any opposition and still needs necessarily to presuppose the possibility of an opposition. On peut donc dire que le support, so uh, uh, we can actually say that the, the uh, support, uh, that, that on, on which authority relies on, um, is necessarily an agent in the proper and stronger, I'm, I'm trying to translate, in the proper and stronger sense of the term, meaning an agent that is supposed to be free and, um, and conscious, I mean, uh, conscient or aware. Hmm? So the idea is that precisely authority presuppose a free and, and conscious agent on the other side. That could be the only, uh, the only character on which authority may rely. So Kochev's theological and paradoxical notion of authority provides a good ground for testing what Le Magresse defines as the traps of consent or the aporias of consent, namely the regressum ad infinitum presupposing the idea of consent, uh, uh, the idea that 
consent may never be consensual in the end. Now, I'm not here reclaiming uh, Khrushchev's notion of authority versus uh, consent. I'm in fact suggesting that authority must be disrupted precisely for its performative power effect. And this is where I would reclaim, contra the Me Too appeal to consent, a distinct notion of dissent, not only along the lines of no means no, but also, and, and more importantly, along the lines of dissidence as the practice of active challenging the existing patriarchal order. Dissent and dissidence need to be grounded in a feminist theory of responsibility that explains why women are positively responsible for fighting the power effects of authority or for accepting them for different purposes, no moral blame. Um, Egel's theory of action, in my view, offers an interesting notion of responsibility, responsibility for the changes that take place as a, consequences of, uh, as a consequence of one's deed. And the Me Too logic elaborates a theory of interactions, which is premised on what Hegel would define as formal right. I quote, in connection with formal right, we noted that it contained only prohibitions and that an action strictly in keeping with right consequently had a purely negative determination in respect of the will of others. Instead, in the middle section of the philosophy of right, in morality, on the other hand, Hegel develops a theory of action that tackles the difficult question of what a subject has moral responsibility for. In morality, he argues, in contrast to formal right, the determination of my will with reference to the will of the others is positive. And such positivity also translates into the possibility of assuming responsibility in relation to objectivity. Hegel's, Hegel's theory of action is concerned with the interconnection of the subject's purpose, its intention, its deeds, its consequences in the whole external environment to determine the agent's responsibility for the effects that occur as a consequence of the action itself. It thus raises the question of where does one's actions and one's responsibility begin and end. And I quote from Hegel, the deed poses an alteration to this given existence, design, and the will is entirely responsible for it insofar as the abstract predicate mind attaches to the existence so altered. Hegel's theory of action is particularly valuable in my attempt at rejecting victimhood as it does not allow room for victims since the subject is the series of its actions and cannot find any escapism in the realm of intentions. Hegel's morality thus provides a fruitful grounds for feminist theory of responsibility, both in relation to what it allows us to say about the aggressors who receive absolute condemnation since alleged intentions cannot be played against um, actions and um, and the right to objectivity in that case implies, and I quote, that the right of action to assert itself as known and willed by the subject as a, think as a thinking agent, end of quote. But also for women, we have a different implication resulting from Hegel's theory of action. The good news is that Hegel does not deny women the right to responsibility, uh, while children, imbeciles, lunatics are uh, considered not responsible. Mm? So th that, I would say, is the good news. But this comes with, with a prize or a challenge, the right and duty uh, for responsibility. Now, I don't want to project on Engel a sort of uh, Sartrean uh, understanding of freedom, um, b because it, I think it's not his understanding of freedom. Um, I'm rather reclaiming responsibility as the task of facing the an escapable entrenchment of deeds and circumstances with the goal of engaging one's deeds in and against the circumstances. I read in Hegel's theory of action a call to action for two main reasons. Because subjects are through actions, so a non-acting subject is a non-subject, so to say, and because actions can make the difference by producing consequences. Counterintuitively, therefore, I suggest that a strategy of dissent and dissidence, in spite of the negative semantics to which those terms are associated, dissent and dissidence appear as mere forms of negation, actually disclose the factual possibility for positive determination by means of negation. Dissent and dissidence qua actions can also be considered as manifestations of a specific and sui generis form of political labor or building, one that engages with the matters at stake to radically reconfigure them. 
I move to the second slogan, I believe you, Egal on punishment, revenge, and justice. So together with only yes means yes, I believe you is the other crucial slogan of the Me Too. While inaugurating a fundamental blow or contre-coup uh, against the long history of impunity of sexual violence and so-called secondary victimization endured by women suffering from the way in which uh, criminal and civil institutions uh, dealt with a uh, victim of sexual abuse, Me Too also introduced a serious challenge to a fundamental pillar of democratic or even bourgeois justice, the presumption of innocence. In the Me Too practice, um, accusation and social conviction are one and the same thing. And Trauco aptly highlights that, for example, in the case of, of uh, plaintiffs for robbery or um, yeah, for theft, uh, the claimants are not exposed to question, to, are not exposed to being questioned uh, like feminist survivors of sexual abuses. They're not supposed to prove that they've been resisting to the theft or resisting to the robbery. Um, yet, on the other hand, we can recall a different asymmetry uh, in case of, of robbery. Uh, I can easily maybe report the crime without being questioned about my morals, uh, but I can win a lawsuit where I accuse Raugo of theft, of theft without being able to prove it. In the context of Me Too, two major landscapes for justice can be outlined. So the criminal justice system, civil law is also of course part of it, but it seems to me that um, the, a lot of the political, moral, affective capital of the Me Too has been channeled into the criminal justice system more than into the, the civil um, law system uh, for the design and implementation of new penal legislations. Um, so on the one hand, the criminal justice system, on the other hand, the public court of social and traditional media. And in relation to the latter, by public naming and shaming aim at excommunication, Me Too has introduced social media trials where charges of sexual assault, if not criminally relevant, appeal to moral reproach and end up pillaring individual perpetrators, often referred as predators, whose right to defense may be denied by the anonymity of the accusation against them or the lack of explicit reference to it, etc. Pre-conviction at the court of public opinion is an intrinsic component of the cultural logic of the Me Too, and it, interestingly, pre-conviction simultaneously coincides with punishment. So out of legitimate rage and suffering, protocols of justice are, in the last instance, reformed in practice. Hegel's conception of the administration of justice, of course, um, refer to uh, the way in which right is posited and known and all the contingencies of feeling and opinion and the forms of revenge, I'm quoting from Hegel, compassion and selfishness should fall away so that right only then attains its true determinacy and is duly honored. My aim here is not to pedantically follow Hegel on its contempt for public opinion, this unorganized way in which the will and opinions of the people make themselves known, which is, according to his view, a manifest self-contradiction, an appearance of cognition, where the essential is just as immediately present as the inessential. And um, in the last instance, as you know it, public opinion needs to be respected and despised. Uh, according to Hegel. But I am sympathetic with Hegel's stance on the tragedy of public opinion in which substantial and arbitrary, so the contingencies of opinion um, with what it names ignorance and perverseness, false information and errors of judgment all come to the scene. And feminists have been experiencing historically the oppressive character of public opinion, like social trials condemning them as deviant or abject women for transgressive behaviors. What I'm suggesting, in fact, following Hegel's acknowledgement of the public sphere as an important means of education, I quote, the quote was important means of education, is that radical feminists qua ward historical women, to paraphrase Hegel again, and in tune with the spirit of the time, could occupy the public opinion arena with a political pedagogical mission aimed at rethinking feminist justice beyond punitivism. Now that Me Too uh, has broken the silence on sexual violence and made previously dismissed topics finally discussable, at least at a certain level, the discursive space needs to be expanded to ask what are the options and interventions that can be envisioned for addressing the wrongdoing of sexual misconduct for addressing the wrongs committed, for addressing the wrongdoers, and also for redressing uh, those who suffered sexual abuses of any kind. 
what are the most effective avenues or options for compensation, for redress, and for healing of individual women who have been wronged. But also, quoting the title of a provocative editorial of the New York Times written by Katie Baker, an investigative reporter who has covered um, Me Too scandals, what to do with this man? Um, and she goes as follows, Me Too is supposed to reckon with the misdeeds of old men, not just the rich and the powerful. Bad men are not just on our TV screens, but in our classrooms, our workplaces, our friend circles, our families. Where should they go if they are fired from their jobs, expelled from their schools, kicked out of their homes, and, or shunned by their communities? And she continues, Me Too is also supposed to reflect a spectrum of coercive behavior, not just crimes that should lead to prison sentences. Bill Cosby is one thing, but many women don't want the sales manager who got too handsy at a Christmas party to be banished forever, let alone to go to prison. What do we want from abusers, she asked. Under what terms should they be allowed to return to normal life? Is there a way to explore possibility of redemption that don't put more of a burden on the people harmed in the first place? And then she admits that she doesn't have an answer to those questions, but she wants this question to be taken seri seriously. But actually, feminists do take this question seriously and have been providing opposite answers, I would say. So-called casual feminists are asking for harsher legislation, the so-called zero tolerance approaches, to all forms of sexual misconduct. And Hegel, I reckon, would probably be on their side rather than on the side of those who advocate for restorative or reparative justice against the retributive paradigm as regular punishment for the crime is the only means for re-establishing the right violated to the point that even the con convicted actually should agree with the punishment. Um, so Hegel opts for retributive justice. However, Hegel would also reject exemplary, exemplary punishment aimed at preventing by threat the reproduction and reiteration of crimes. As he writes, um, it's uh, paragraph 99, uh, that threat uh, is not compatible with right, as the threat presupposes that human beings are not free and seeks to coerce them through the representation, the forced telling of an evil. But right and justice must have, must have their seat in freedom and the will, and not in the lack of freedom at which the threat is directed. To justify punishment in this way is like raising one stick at a dog. It means treating a human being like a dog instead of respecting his honor and freedom, end of quote. So for seeking possible answers beside the coordinates of retributive justice, one has to maybe leave Hegel behind and turn to the lesson taught by black feminists. I'm thinking about Angela Davis and Belux, among others, or anti-racist movements to court as an antidote to the neoliberal trend of enforcing criminalization in the penitentiary system. I disagree with Rauco in his characterization of the kind of criticism addressed to, to carceral feminism. It's not that in the name of some sort of anarchist stimmung, uh, but rather in the name of a fairer justice, a fairer than the one dispensed by the neoliberal state through its criminal justice system, that anti-carceral feminists may reject the punitivism of the Me Too. Uh, for example, Loïc Vacan in his classic book Punishing the Poor from 2009 has brilliantly detected the dynamic of increasing criminalization of poverty and distress. And interestingly, already in that book, which is a pre-Me Too book, um, it was already uh, profiling the, the figure of the sexual predator who, he said, uh, wrote, had acquired a central place in the country's expansive, talking about the United States, public culture of vilification of criminals. As the living embodiment of moral abjectness, he provides an urgent and perpetually refreshed motive for the full repudiation of the idea of rehabilitation and turn to the fierce neutralization and vengeful retribution. And here, uh, Vacant also refers to the racial ins inscriptions of uh, notions of uh, predatory sexuality as a way to intensify uh, racial um, antagonism. Interestingly enough, however, sexual abuses that benefited of a long scandalous tradition of impunity against which radical feminists have been fighting for decades since the 60s onward, are now entering the neoliberal pattern or hyper-criminalization. In response to Me Too, there have been some moves towards more punitive legal approaches uh, to deal with sexual harassment and violence. I'm thinking about the anti-street harassment law in France in 2018, similar laws that have been enforced in the Netherlands, but there could be other examples. Is this what all feminists want? Alternatives do not necessarily amount to bypass the state. 
We can actually argue that the state transitionally maintains its function of dispenser of rights, welfare, and infrastructures, center for recovering from sexual <coughs> abuses, centers for prevention, center for mediation post abuses, anti-sex education, all this still pertain to transitionally to the state. Alternative to punitivism does not necessarily um, sorry, alternative opinions do not necessarily aim to bypass the law either, uh, thinking about civil law and measures that could require from the convicted to contribute financially or socially to the implementation of public infrastructure of the kind that I just mentioned, making amends by supporting economically such infrastructure, or in case of unwealthy individuals by concretely contributing with socially useful work in view of the task of rehabilitation that the Me Too seems not to take as an important component on feminist justice and should. Last, my body, my choice, ego, sexual, ego, sexual intimacy, and sexual politics. So the slogan, as I was saying, was coined as a, well before the Me Too uh, in the feminist struggle for reproductive rights in, in the 60s already. And I will just take it as an entry point to discuss the issue of sexual intimacy and sexual politics. And then I conclude on those. So the aim or the attempt is to pushed me too to engage with the envisionment of, of, of a radical sexual politics of a slightly different kind of the one that it has been expressing so far. Hegel can help on a first level to distinguishing sexual intimacy belonging to morality from sexual politics, politics as belonging to Zitlichkeit. And he would argue, I quote, uh, 213, since morality and moral precepts concern the will in its most personal subjectivity and particularity, they cannot be the object of positive legislation." End of quote. Egel would also maintain that uh, feeling, or as he said, the transient to capricious or the purely subjective aspects of love are excluded from legislation since only those aspects which are by nature capable of having an external dimension can become the object of legislation. And Egel in the end would not argue for regulation for sexual intimacy, which I would rather suggest to read through the prism, for example, of Simon de Beauvoir, Morale de l'ambiguïté. Um, I mean, Beauvoir uses a, a ambiguity uh, to explore this uh, irreducibly dual nature of human experience as living in the world always with others. Human beings are unavoidably both subjects for themselves and objects for others. They are transcendent or free and immanent or limited by the other, exposed to the other, vulnerable um, to others. And she describes ambiguity as this engaged freedom or a surging of the for oneself, which is immediately given for the others. In a Hegelian vein, she argues that freedom can only exist as engaging the world, where it always depends on others for both its practice and its outcomes. Um, and she highlights, like, the, 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 I mean, she really stressed that erotic encounters are um, a paradigmatic example of, of our notion of, of ambiguity, as in erotic encounters simultaneously, uh, the experience of, sub, uh, of objecthood and subjectivity as connected happens simultaneously. Um, therefore, Beauvoir claimed that feeling like an erotic object can be liberating because it offers one a sort of entry point into the constitutive reversal of one's subjectivity. And here, strangely enough, Beauvoir reconnects to pro-sex feminists, for example. Um, but if Beauvoir can help us in thinking sexual intimacy, Hegel can actually support us in thinking sexual politics from a Zitlische perspective as that sphere which needs to be built on economic grounds, uh, welfare provided by the state, and legal premises. As a first step, Hegel would suggest to think of sexual politics as premised on sexual freedom rather than sexual free will. While free will uh, falsifies the nature of social institutions because it regards them as accidental or indifferent or irrelevant, freedom, what ethical freedom, engages with the citizen of its society, its power relations, its laws, its economic and social infrastructure. And Hegel would say that the, I quote, highest freedom consists in the membership of the state. But I suggest we rethink this membership as a dissident membership. I would also suggest that dissent and dissidents become the incarnation of of feminist political resignungen, 
uh, and I see the instantiation of, of such Gesinnungen in, in women's strikes, including sexual strife, uh, women struggles to reject capitalist and patriarchal values or structures, as well as in women practices of solidarity and resistance against economic and racial justice. And those strategies of dissent and dissidence vis-a-vis -vis the status quo, in my view, should be privileged in the feminist agenda versus neoliberal pattern of free will qua agency, carceral conception of punishment, as well as victimis victimistic conception of sexual autonomy only premised on consent. So in conclusion, consent must be defended, but consent must also be exceeded by way of feminist dissent and dissidence with the aim to overcome what I see as two not an essential and, and critical aspects of the Me Too cultural politics, its limited capacity to addressing the underlying economic condition that exas exacerbate gender violence and its partial restrictions of feminist goals to the individual <coughs> and the punitive rather than the collective and the redistributive. I'll leave it here. So let us start with questions. Andrea? Yes. Andrea, oh, feel free to um, you know, speak with your own words about your own argument. And I'm sorry, what's your name? Oh, Boyan. Borna, okay, thanks. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question regarding the notion of authority taken from Kozhev that you mentioned. Uh, I want to go back to the way you described it as a kind of spontaneous consent, which does not need to be scrutinized nor absolutized through violence and repression, and also a kind of consent that presupposes resistance, presupposes the ability to mm -hmm. resist it. My question is actually meant as a little bit of an excurse outside of the politics of Me Too, but it does have to do with it as well. Since authority presupposes resistance, what of the subjects lacking, so, so to speak, the ontological grounding for resistance. For example, we know that the notion of authority which Kozhev uh, analyzes here has its roots in contractual social theory, social of the social contract, which presupposes a kind of uh, intellectually fit subject in order to make the contract. For example, uh, s scholars on disability studies have uh, produced various works regarding the sort of uh, presuppositions that one may have about what makes a subject fit for engagement and for uh, participating in the social contract. So if you could just say a few words regarding this problem of resistance and authority with regards to other kinds of subjects and other kinds of women that might find themselves in situations of sexual abuse, be they uh, neurodivergent women or uh, women of a, or, I don't know, POC or anyone else who might encounter a problem with ontological resistance. Yeah. So th thanks for the question, Bar. Um, so uh, the first thing, yes, I mentioned how the notion of authority in Kozhev is actually very circular. Um, uh, and, and authority cannot be forced if it's forced. It's not authority anymore. And if it's approved, for example, elections, political, since one of the examples of, of the authorities is the leader, so uh, the, the, the democratic election of a leader undermine authority, so to say. There is authority where there's no scrutiny or specific approval. And consent uh, happens in this more spontaneous way. Um, I'm not, so, so the, your question is what happens in where this resistance cannot be, um, ca cannot exist? Well, again, very theologically, Kojav would say if there's no resistance, there cannot be authority. Because precisely, for example, God does not exert authority because nobody could resist to God, to the divine power. So we cannot even understand or conceive God as an authority precisely because uh, such an authority wouldn't allow the possibility for resistance, so this could not be resistance. And again, this is an answer from a Kozhevian perspective. So basically saying, for Kozhev, if there's no resistance, there's no authority. So the, 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 the issue doesn't raise. If there's no possibility of resistance, there's abuse, there's violence, there's something else. Uh, and then again, um, the, the contractual model, the contractual model is precisely what Kozhev is, is um, rejecting for thinking authority. Hmm? We, we cannot presuppose 
uh, uh, authority as premise on a contract, right? Otherwise, once again, it wouldn't be authority. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not suggesting, like, let's go back to Kojev, no from authority. We're just thinking that it's interesting to read what happens when we push the definition of consent uh, to the point where actually the possibility for consenting becomes very limited. If many different sort of asymmetries actually does not allow one person to consent. And I was like, then we are into this sort of trap of Kojev's notion of authority where there's no way or there's no possibility to actually uh, consent. Uh, th there is, or, or actually, there is the possibility of, of spontaneous consent uh, precisely because this authority is exerted in a way which is not violent uh, nor um, formally approved. So I, I'm not reclaiming it. I'm, I'm saying it, it may be read uh, to explain what happened when we restrict notion of consent. But thanks for the question. <laughs> mm? Sorry? Yeah. I, I, thank you. I just wanted to say that. No, 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 nothing. Yeah, it's all right. It was fun. No, I don't know. I missed it. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your time. Sir. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks so much, Jamila. This was really interesting. I have sort of a half-baked suggestion or thought, and I wondered if you have some, something um, that, you can do with, that you can do with the suggestion. But um, I keep thinking about resources in the phenomenology of spirit that might be useful um, for developing some of the ideas that you have in the paper. And I was thinking um, specifically about the chapter about conscience and the beautiful soul and Hegel's reflections on um, forgiveness and reconciliation in that context. And um, I mean, as soon as I thought that, I, I was immediately made aware of all the ways in which that's a limited model. <laughs> and one thing that occurred to me is that Hegel is, is emphasizing this, the symmetry between the two parties that need to um, enter into some kind of reconciliation. And they both have to confess that they've been evil, and there has to be a kind of breaking of the hard heart on one side. Um, and then he also has a statement in that context where he says, the wounds of spirit heal and leave no scars behind. And then you might wonder whether that's op overly optimistic in terms of the kind of communal healing um, that he's depicting there. So these were sort of maybe reasons to hesitate about using that chapter. But I wondered if you had any thoughts about what might be fruitful about Hegel's reflections in that context. Yeah, no, th thank you. Thanks a lot. It's a, actually a great suggestion. I mean, especially for trying to think of the possibility of a prism or a paradigm of uh, sort of reparative justice. Of course, in the in philosophy, right, I mean, most discourses revolve around uh, retribution as the only form of justice, or at least I cannot recall anything that would resonate more with reparative justice from the philosophy of right. But you're right, in, in, indeed, I mean, the, 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 the thinking of, of reconciliation through um, the, the, the figures of the phenomenology can actually allow us to develop a sort of Hegelian approach to reparative justice or restorative justice. Um, I would say that, I mean, as, um, as, as a Marxist and a materialist, I, I also have, um, let's say, I, I also do, do not only believe that reparative justice uh, can purely work in this sort of uh, communal and um, not infrastructurally rooted uh, way, I mean, there, there are many, there is a huge feminist debate about uh, how reparation or restorative justice can be implemented in case of sexual abuses, and some of these processes in, in, indeed distance from, uh, from the state, uh, from the uh, insertion if in the ethical infrastructure, so to say, in Sittlichkeit, but um, actually um, th there are other uh, kind of definition of how reparative approaches can be implemented also through the state, so not only in antagonism with the state. So I do believe that that I mean one can try to to, to think of reparative justice through Hegel. I just focus on on the on the philosophy right, but that's actually something that could be thought about. With the idea, I would say that there's I mean there's no proper or full reconciliation. There's no possibility of undoing what has been done. I mean, I think that reconciliation or reparation should always be premised on this sort of intrinsic irreparability that somehow comes with it. So it's not a fully optimistic possibility for reconciliation. And then, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Jamila. 
<coughs> First, um, I would like to thank you for engage, engaging with the text I wrote. I think that it's the uh, ultimate. If, if you dissent, that and that means that you took it seriously, and this is probably the ultimate uh, manifestation of praise. Uh, so thank you. But on the other hand, I'm not sure whether this thank shouldn't be uh, retracted, but, but because um, I don't think that there is much uh, dissidence uh, in our position. It's more about, uh, I would say, even not about uh, uh, Hegel, it's more about uh, how to describe the weak, uh, 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 Me Too movement and uh, those elements that are important and un un unimportant part of it. However, there seems to be one point that we might uh, disagree. Um, and I think that it, it, it is the use of consent. However, I'm not, even on that, I'm not sure this is so, because you ended, uh, yes, uh, consent should be defended, but it uh, must be defended, but it should also be exceeded, which again, we can easily uh, agree on. Uh, regarding the, uh, the consent, what I find here, let's say, suspicious and dangerous, um, and uh, makes me wonder why it is so, uh, why, why some people still stick to it, is that usually it is uh, interpreted along the, let's say, contractual lines. If we, go, if we speak about consent, then we speak about the contract with everything that goes with it, you know, the existing, um, let's say, property relations, power relation, uh, judicial system, which we do not accept, of course, because it could, should have been better and so on. And we stick uh, a very um, fluid thing that is inter uh, uh, relation between the sexes into the form of law. Uh, and now, what does it mean? Should we fi uh, sign contract be between meeting us, between even meeting us, between even engaging the possibility to end somewhere? Well, I think that this is this is this is a full question. This is a, a, a question that, in my opinion, is a, a proxy question. You know, it's a question that is uh, there to deflect other questions. It is instrumental questions, because if we uh, look at the practice in, the, in those countries that did include this notion "yes means yes" into their legal practice, then we see. So far, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm not an expert, but what I did so see is that it's uh, usually about the question. Can the perpetrator assume that the, uh, the, the consent was given? The perpetrator or the accused um, uh, cannot start from the position that the content, uh, consent was given. It should, this, this is the, I think, the legal requirement. And this consent could be manifested in many, many ways. And once again, I think that uh, legal practice can here be very innovative, even more innovative, even more speculative than those who pretend to be philosophers and theoreticians. Because uh, in Sweden, there was uh, a new crime uh, uh, introduced, and this is, you know, negligent ra rape which I like very much because it means that rape could happen, could have happened without the rapist having intention to do it and perhaps without even knowing in advance that that, 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 that happened. Yeah. This is one thing about the statistics and the other, the way the, the justice is served after the introduction of this uh, concept. The other is that, you know, nevertheless, even in Sweden, the statistics m make you think, make you think that this is still not enough. Why? Because out of, out of reported now, the, the percentage of positive convictions, uh, I think that uh, uh, the number of positive convictions has risen by 60%. However, then that means that it has risen, uh, I think, from 3.4, to 6.1 or something. You know, it's still one of those, um, let's say, crimes that is still, uh, that the most rarely uh, ends with a conviction. So it's, re it's still 
really, really hard to um, uh, obtain a conviction. Uh, so I don't know where, where, where this fear comes from, unless from the very traditional position of male power that is afraid of uh, being uh, limited. The other thing is why to stick with the notion uh, that the consent can be uh, conceived only in legal terms. Because, you know, Hegel, and this was my alternative proposal, why to think uh, of consent in the, in the terms of a contract while we have in Hegel himself uh, the model of marriage, which is not, which implies consent, but it, it is not contract. It is starting from the position of uh, uh, contract to supersede it, yes. Why not, why not to think it in that way? Let's say uh, uh, an expression uh, to be willing to engage in common activity, for instance, uh, in the, to form certain unity, which marriage, marriage is, uh, to participate in uh, perhaps not das allgemeine Werk, but for that reason uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with das gemeine, uh, uh, das gemeine Werk. And uh, perhaps on the end, uh, for the end, uh, consent, dissent, I really like it, this one, dissent. However, I don't know how to, let's say, give it uh, a little bit more concrete uh, manifestation. Uh, and at the end, it should be some, somewhere written into. Uh, I, I don't know, you, you said, we should, uh, uh, consent uh, must be defended, but it also has, uh, must be, Exceeded, but this excess should be excess should be written somewhere, put down into the law, and and that would be probably different. And if not into the law, where to? Okay, I'll start from this last detail because I'm wondering if if I made myself clear. Consent must be defended. Uh, but it also must be exceeded. It's not exceeded in, in, in the uh, encounter. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that consent must be exceeded from, from uh, the perspective of, of feminist justice. So we cannot only focus on consent. That was the idea, okay? So, so I'm not sure if I understood your very last remark, which was how this can be inscribed into legislation. Because I was not saying that one should describe dissent, like making laws on dissent. I was saying dissent as a political practice, as I, I mentioned of dissent as dissidents, as political disposition of Gesinnungen. So I'm not thinking of how to legally formalize dissent. Um, th that was not my proposal. The idea was to exceed in the sense feminists should go beyond uh, the, 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 the battle over consent and enlarge uh, feminist um, struggles towards different dissident strategies that, uh, so to say, confront patriarchal and racial capitalism on different fronts. So that, that was the, the notion of how to exceed um, consent, not to concretely exceed consent or formalizing the possibility of exceeding consent in the law. But to go back to so our agreement, disagreement, I think that, that we, we, we do disagree on, on a very primary level, the, the, the fact that you characterize in the article the, the criticism that you recognize, I mean, uh, that, and that I reconstructed uh, through your words as criticism that are indifferently, uh, that could be indifferently attributed to, let's say, conservative and progressive uh, standpoints. I, I do not believe that my criticism, for example, could be, as you said, be deployed from the perspective of, of male power. I, 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 and, and if it sounds so, it's a failure. But uh, the, the idea was really to distinguish the kind of uh, Catherine Deneuve uh, claim for the right of seduction or you know, male's defense of uh, um, of the, the right to whatever freely seduce from the kind of criticism that they're developing. So the way in which in your article you say, you know, on the left and on the right they're actually claiming the same thing, I would disagree with that because I think that even if some of the content of the claims may sound similar, they come from very different perspectives with very different aims and goals. Uh, the second thing, I think that where we actually do agree is that I don't have specific problem about consent in terms of uh, you know, when the debate comes to, but consent is too contractual. No, my problem is not that consent is too contractual, and I agree with you that an interesting way of uh, thinking of a non-contractual way of consenting beyond the example of, 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 of Kojev consent to authority could be looking at the marriage, you said as a temporal uh, sexual relation where 
you know, the contractual position is actually overcome. So I, I, I agree with that, why not? But my criticism of the focus of consent is actually the kind of, uh, what kind of process of, of subjectivation we offer to women uh, along these lines, and if, if we focus on consent, if we restrict consent, if we start saying that asymmetry does not allow for consent, what is left hmm, in terms of responsibility for women? Uh, and on the other hand, my criticism of consent is related to uh, what I, I mean, what I define, it's not me defining it, the, the, the debate about carceral feminists is very old, and your objection that, but look at the statistics, actually we could even say that th those restrictions, uh, those harsher legislation that have been passed are not even enough. Look at the statistics, sexual abuses, sexual violence, sexual assault are still happening. Then one could either you know, look at the empirical and said, this is, could actually suggest that it's not that it's not enough, it's probably not the right way, or anyway, do not conflate the, um, the, 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 the critique to the punitive, uh, punitivist drift uh, of the Me Too with the vindication of, again, like male power, male supremacy or the possibility of, of uh, you know, male impunity. This is not what I'm claiming. And, and I'm actually drawing on the work of abolitionist, um, you know, like Angela Davis, that we cannot, I mean, of course, we can doubt of everything, but if you don't trust me, uh, think about the sort of uh, lines of thought developed by people like Davis or, or Hoax, who has been clearly arguing for the reason why the state and even more the carcel uh, <laughs> Uh, system or the, the criminal law system cannot be perceived as per se a source for justice uh, for its concrete historical instantiations but um, but also for relying on a different conception of justice a justice which is not merely retributive uh, justice which could also rehabilitate that raise the question of how to produce rehabilitation and uh, looking at the uh, perverse logic, I mean, what, what I was trying to illustrate to the example of account of the way in which the neoliberal state is relying more and more on punishment. So we cannot, as feminists, raise a question about what does it mean to claim, reclaim a punishment more and more. We, we cannot, I mean, completely dissociate the, this tendency of the neoliberal state from the uh, Me Too focus on punitivism. At least the question should be raised. So what does it mean for feminists reclaiming um, punitivism to, to that point? Uh, I don't know if there was another thing. So dissent as contract. Yeah, and maybe for the, 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 last, the very last thing is that concrete example. I mean, I, I know that it was sketched um, and, and maybe left very vague, but the idea of thinking of dissent versus consent and dissent as dissidents as practices or uh, and practices of responsibilities, it's rather to refer to classical example of feminist struggle that um, rather than focusing on consent per se or punishment would actually resent on different priorities. So the economic grounds of gender-based violence on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, also the possibility maybe of, of elaborating a different understanding of the fact that um, Collectively, uh, responsible. Biggest, sorry for the digression, but one argument against responsibility is: okay, we are back again to this individual notion that women should fight individually every day on their own uh, uh, patriarchy and uh, you know uh, sexual abuses. I don't think that this is individual. I mean, working on a reconfiguration of the possibility of of, of uh, dissent and desire, it's something that can be done collectively. And I can think of dozens of you know, feminist experience from the collective group of uh, autocoscienza to the uh, healing uh, sisterhood groups uh, from black feminism. All those examples can be thought as collective practices. So going back to responsibility is not necessarily going back to individuality. Um, so those practices can be thought as practices that actually challenge patriarchy in dissenting with its structure, dissenting with its value, but even dissenting with this idea that women are victims and that what is left to women is just the possibility of consenting. Sorry, I get uh, emotional for some reason. <laughs> uh, we have uh, one more question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jamila, for a beautiful and strong paper. Um, I'm, I think that if I'm, it's, it's really a concrete question. Um, 
Am I wrong when I say that um, I can interpret your paper as a, a critique of liberal feminism? The fetishization of the individualism, also including um, this kind of relying uh, only on law, on the specific uh, carceral um, approaches to the problem. So what I read is actually that we cannot discuss the sexual violence only on terms of um, carcerality and that the, the problem of not dealing with the, the problems of sexual violence on, in, in, a, in the right terms is also the problem of feminism. So when Zdravko say, you know, we, the state and whatever, you know, institutions do not work their job properly, I think also that the problem is inside the feminism, the carceral feminism, neoliberalization of feminism. And what I wanted to ask, th this was a comment, um, maybe to expand a bit more on this critique of carceral feminism and to link it with Hegel. You mentioned that he will probably support it. So maybe, maybe I misinterpreted you, but maybe can you expand a bit more on that? Where, where do you see him? Is he on, on the side of critique of carceral feminism or he is building, building it up? And what do you think about uh, Francois Verger? and um, uh, uh, Giovanna Franca della Costa, um, the, the, her, her essay on, on love and work and sexual violence. Uh, thanks a lot for, for, for the question. So indeed, yes, it is a critique of neoliberal feminism, which I think it's, I wouldn't say, I mean, it's the only way in which we can characterize me too, but there is a component of it. And maybe, I mean, I would also say that there is a sort of quite relevant component of the Me Too, which is oriented towards what I would say resonate. I mean, not necessarily aims at uh, you know, achieving a neoliberal agenda, but resonate with some of the goals, the words, the strategies, etc. So it is uh, the case. Then what I was saying about Hegel, I, I mean, again, uh, along the lines of what I was responding to Andrea uh, earlier, maybe one can think of process of reconciliation in the phenomenology as a way to think of reparative justice with Hegel. But if we look at what is in the philosophy of right, I mean, the, the, the administration of justice um, and, and in general, I mean, the punishment of crime, it's conceived as a cancellation, as an aufhebung of, of the crime that can be done uh, retributively. So, uh, and then of course, there's a whole debate about how this can be done, what kind of equivalence one can think of for what is really retributive, um, how the elements of particularity and contingency also plays and why, how justice can really concretely uh, uh, punish that specific crime. But I don't see, and I ask other Egalians to help me here, if, if you think that there's a possibility to think of a different product of justice in the philosophy of right, which is not a retributive one. I, I don't think so, so but, but feel free to dissent or disagree. Um, Françoise Verges, yes, Françoise is, is also a, a very good friend, and, and, I, and I think that, I mean, in, in, in France, um, somehow she has been, um, I, I would say, initiating uh, at least in, in the last few years, like this uh, critique of of carceral feminists from what she would call like a decolonial perspective. I'm less I'm less into the decolonial for different reasons, but that's another debate. Uh, but I guess that there are arguments that I that I completely share uh, in terms of again looking at the history of of the criminal state and and its targets, thinking whether. Um, that that uh, institution can be considered the one who is dispensing justice. And again, I'm not just thinking, I mean, of course, I'm thinking uh, through the prism of uh, racial justice and racial injustices, but even if we think of uh, what uh, Dworkin or McKinnon were say, um, I mean, so fa famous um, anti-pornography feminists, well, they were saying, yes, for sure, we don't want Playboy, but we don't want the government to produce legislation against pornography because Playboy is the government, so to say. So the, the construction of the legitimacy of the state or, or, or state institution for being the one who can really uh, dispense and implement justice, it's, it's a common, I would say, historical feminist trend. So actually challenge and question the state 
and the laws while at the same time reclaiming rights and welfare and infrastructure for from the states that, that I think it's been always the double level of feminist engagement uh, I'm wondering now why this uh, claim for, for punishment is taking the lead. What seems to me being taking the lead? Because again, sexual violence are not a fresh theme for, for, for the history of feminist struggles. They've been there for a long time. And I, I see a punitivist twist um, that has been also accompanied by the Me Too um, wave. <coughs> OK, do we have? Um, I just have a quick, a quick question, yes. Yeah, just a quick question. Grazie. Um, simply, you know, it, it just comes from what you were saying um, uh, towards the end of your response to Anka, uh, to Ankita, the question of, um, I was thinking, why the mistrust for the government? Is this something specific you think in maybe... In and McKinnon or in well, myself or... In you, in you, in you, but in general as well. In the sense that, is it, is it something connected specifically to the United States and its own history of uh, police, incarceration, uh, and so on? Or is it a more general statement of, um, you know, government should never be trusted in any sort of historical possible condition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, when I'm talking about the, 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 the criminal law system, so specifically, think about you know the police as an institution, right? Not the police, but the police. Uh, the, the the police. Uh, I, I guess that, and again, I, I really trivialize. But different people, when seeing the police, react differently. If you are a political activist, if you are a racialized person, if you are also, I mean, a woman in a precarious condition, what a policeman incarnated from the view, it's really not necessarily, not firstly, an instance of justice. So for me, this is as basic as such, in the sense that in, in my also personal and political history, well, it's not that if I'm, in a, I call the police, let's say I never call the police, Let, let's put it this way. So, um, and I'm, again, I would still distinguish uh, the police as the specific instantiation of, of criminal justice from the state that still can maintain uh, function. I don't know what you think in the sense that, of course, I mean, from a Marxist perspective, also the uh, the, the, the abolition of the state idea is a perspective uh, to embrace, but the state still, and, and it makes totally sense to reclaim rights from the state, to reclaim infrastructure from the state, to reclaim wealth from the state. So that function, I think, should be addressed in the sense that the state is an interlocutor for feminist struggle, but the criminal law system, it's not. And I was saying, what, what, your question is just looking at the United States. No, it's not just because Black Lives Matter there. I think that there is a serious issue about what the, the you know, law enforcement by the police represents in every, all sorts of different contexts, depending on how are you positioned, let's say, in the spectrum of the, of the social and power relations in society. Okay, um, thank you. So let's take a five minute break and then we're back. <laughs> 